My name is Daniel. I've become obsessed with the topic of cloud and how it fueled a new age of business and deeply impacted the way we live and work. Over the last 20 years, we've all seen cloud become the de facto strategy. But I wanted to know how the nuances of cloud adoption were challenging businesses in the fullness of time. As a term, it seems to be shrouded in ambiguity. And like all fashions, it seems to have been styled and restyled in a variety of ways. Cloud has undoubtedly offered the world a new utility to innovate. But it's also given us a whole new host of things that we should really be thinking about. Like many others, I had become confused with how we talk about cloud. And that's why I embarked on a journey of cloud anthropology in an attempt to discover why the topic of cloud became so clouded. I'm no technologist, but I have made a career in researching the underlying behaviours that inform technology adoption. This is the story of my journey and the things I learned from the people who freely gave me their time and their opinions. Francesco, Corey Quinn, Lesson Burgess, Bill Roth, Scott Robertson, Joe Bagley, yep. Simon Hansford, Kirk Resnicker, Grant Challenger, Russell McDonald, Nirvana Farahadi, Thomas Maurer. I'm Luke Julia and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the uh, Renault Group. Let's go back a little bit, you know, uh, 20 years ago, right? So 20 years ago, a lot of people realized that uh, in order to operate on the internet, you needed some kind of uh, network operation, right? And uh, people started to create their own uh, um, cloud. So their own, basically, uh, um, you know, storage and compute locally. So this is what we call now on-premise, right? So, um, so they started to uh, gather a lot of machines and to create their own data centers, basically, in, in their own facilities. And this is, you know, back in the early 2000 years, right? So the internet, let's say, came up in 95, right? 94, 95. And uh, really the operations begin to grow uh, early 2000. Uh, and so at that time, everybody was basically doing their own, uh, their, their own data centers. And uh, thanks to, uh, I think, AWS was really, you know, the first one to uh, uh, give the services that they developed for themselves to others, right? And this is uh, when the, the public cloud became something that, uh, that was available. But when the cloud started, the first motion was uh, public cloud first. So everybody was pushed to bring everything, to bring that data onto this public cloud, this concept of a fluffy something uh, up in the air somewhere else, which seemed to be an interesting idea. And, um, and some companies in particular uh, out of Europe adopted it pretty quickly. There was a very big hype at the beginning, so everybody was moving to the public cloud. Everyone's doing it. Why are they doing it? What's it doing? What's it getting them? Right. And and you have to take a step back as opposed to just jumping in going, well, everyone's doing this. Why, why, have I, why have I joined the queue? You don't really know, right? What do you think about cloud as a universal term? Shocking. Um, I hate it. Um, and, you know, it's in my job title, you know, principal cloud architect. We've got different folk who have different opinions of what that word means, right? For the majority, I think it's that ubiquitous, fluffy thing that you, it's not really tangible to folk, right? And, and I think it probably was 10 years ago. Right? I mean, this is obviously where it all started. You know, the, the, the kind of commodity compute services of, of, of AWS, that's what sort of kicked all this off, right? The cloud's become almost a meaningless word now in our industry. The, the, the problem is, and if I go back to when we were doing Cloud Camp back in 2007, when we were first starting, a lot of the arguments about what is cloud, what isn't cloud, what should be cloud, you know, NIST comes out with the definition of cloud and everyone sort of clamors around that. But ultimately it's become just an interchangeable word for something to do with computers that my phone and my laptop talk to, seems to be at the moment. And the, the problem is now people are trying to do nuanced definitions of cloud around, you know, it's always been the fight around private cloud, hybrid cloud, public cloud, the, the continual misuse of on-premises, off-premises, or whatever people want to do. So whereas sort of 10 years ago, cloud was the thing, the infrastructure that those providers were giving to you, for me, it's morphed into how you use that, right? So automation, delivery as code, software definitions of stuff, right? All of that 
was born about because the likes of AWS and, and Microsoft have abstracted the tin, the wires, and the physicality of, of traditional infrastructure away from you as an end user, right? They've taken care of that, they operate it, they own it, they maintain it, and they deliver that to you as a service, right? So for me, cloud is that it's consumption and delivery of stuff as a service. And it's that definition of the service that I think people are struggling with right now. The cloud created a cultural shift across the globe becoming a ubiquity seemingly overnight. But in a rush to get to the cloud, organizations and governments alike were quick to rubber stamp their cloud first strategies, expecting transformation and cost cutting by Christmas. However, it didn't take long for some to realize that not everything was as clear cut as it first seemed. Cloud became clouded as soon as it arrived. It just took companies 15 years to understand the nuances of that. There's fashions in IT. There's fads in IT, I think. And if you look at this cycle that happens, yeah, what you'll get is um, CIOs. And CIOs will have a vision or a CTO will have a vision. And the average tenure of a CIO is somewhere in the region of two to three years, actually. And so typically, it's, as a CIO, you come in, you've got about 12 months grace to kind of blame everything on the last person, whoever the previous CIO was. And then you've got to come up with some sort of plan and you've got a year or so to actually start seeing that execute. And then you, you move on either with, with you know, great success or you quickly run out before everyone finds out it's a scam. And I've lost count over the last 10 plus years of the number of senior IT leaders I've sat opposite that said, we're going to have 50% of our workloads in the public cloud within the next two years. I've not seen anyone do it. It all comes down to the basic biases in behavioral economics. A lot of people have a success bias. They think they're going to be more successful than they're going to. And we've seen that countless times when people are doing migration to the cloud. They will think they can get all 1,000 workloads over to the cloud in a year. They tend to come back to us after about a year, and they've only got about 10% of that done. Because they haven't really looked at what was the cost of migration, they thought they were going to be more successful than they were going to. I think that's what we all forget. Like we get all hooked up in emotions a lot. Like we have, like we have a vision, and that's how. It, and it's hard for people also, like I mean, also for me, to change their like opinion or their mind and agree that they might be wrong on this. Nobody would bet their entire IT strategy uh, based on the results from migrating the easiest workloads to cloud. What you really need to understand is what happens when we get to those really gnarly, sticky, legacy, high-performance workloads that our core business is running on? How easy is it going to be to migrate those things? If you've got a compelling reason you want to shut your data centers down and you want to exit out, you lift and shift. It's the quickest way of doing it. But you're moving an application that was architected to run in this set of infrastructure with this set of constraints over here, which doesn't necessarily have those same constraints. But you're taking a non-cloud native app and you're running it in a cloud platform. That comes with a cost overhead. So you re-engineer it. Well, if it's your compelling application like your e-commerce app, you might want to re-engineer it because it's your IP, right? There's value in doing so. It's specific to you. If it's your ERP app, where do you do you put that in the public cloud? Well, if you do that with no engineering change to the way that you operate and do stuff, it will be, it will be guaranteed more expensive because you can't make use of those other bells and whistles that the cloud provider gives you with you know, its, its features and its functions and its widgets that it puts around it, right? Elasticity is just one part of that. But if you're not making use of that, then it will be more expensive. Why? Because we have too much of legacy applications and data and simply we cannot just move everything on the public cloud. It will not work anymore. So what do we need? We need hybrid cloud. So we need to combine together on-premises private cloud and public cloud. And by the way, we cannot adopt a single public cloud solution because we're going to get into another lock-in and we cannot afford that. So we need hybrid, multi-cloud. I mean, that's true that when we started you know, to move everything on the cloud, let's say, you know, in the early 2010s, um, I mean, it was very fashionable. I mean, it was very, you know, uh, it was great to say, look, I mean, I'm using the latest, you know, technologies. I'm doing those APIs, you know, those things, you know, the, the, all the, the buzzwords that AWS was using at the time, you know, to, you know, uh, steer people towards the, the cloud. So, so this is something that we all use because it was, again, very practical. And 
I personally, you know, love the cloud. I was a pro cloud, cloud guy, you know, public cloud guy, because I said, I don't want to maintain my machine, my machines, you know. I did that for 10 years, in the 2000 years, you know, I was having my own data centers for my startups, you know, and we had to maintain all those things. I mean, it was a nightmare, right, to do that. And then, you know, this is, this thing was just, you know, a bunch of APIs that you operate from a, a portal, you know, and you have those virtual machines that you, yeah, that you, think. I mean, it was incredible. So it was not only hype, but it's all, it was very, very, very practical. But that's true that little by little, I realized, you know, in, at the end of the, the 2010s year, so not long ago, that maybe it's not the most efficient. We think of the, the, the efficiency of the hyperscaler. Uh, we think it's so easy to push a button, to swipe a card, and here's all these computational resources, and I can devour APIs, I can create applications super fast, and then I can spin them up, I can spin them down. And there's sort of that overall question, I know I can do it rapidly, but am I doing it as efficiently as I could back in the day when I had to go through more rigor, when I had to go and, and jump through more hoops, when I had to engineer. So the question sort of is, we've taken this, this, the meter and we've slammed it all the way over to Agile. It is so easy to express a thought and get infrastructure back uh, quickly and easily. But you wonder, if I had designed a purpose-built system, how much more efficient would it have been? How, how fewer bytes would have crossed the network? How, how fewer servers would have been spun up and spun down? How few cycles would have been if I was back in the old days when I actually had a limit on my resources? So suddenly something becomes free, relatively free, it becomes abundant, and I use it abundantly. That's, that makes economic sense. If something's scarce, I want to use it judiciously. Well, now all these resources are abundant and we just have to wonder, do we actually have the full understanding of the ramifications of consuming these resources abundantly? Uh, and will we find out in a couple of years, turns out we should have been a little bit more rigorous, a little bit more judicious in how we've used these resources because there was an unintended consequence. We didn't realize that we were leaving so much efficiency on the table. Uh, and we will come back and say, what were we thinking? Everyone's looking for a silver bullet when it comes to the world of cloud. The problem is, is when the only tool you have is a silver bullet, all your problems start to look suspiciously like werewolves, and then you're leading to a very conspiratorial place. There are no straight shot, easy answers. The story is not just, how am I gonna move to the cloud, but then what are you gonna do afterwards? What is that multi-generational plan because if your vendor that you're moving all your cloud to sort of has an outage or becomes unstable or starts gouging you, um, what are your options? Everyone is looking for efficiencies. And the public cloud's promise of pay for only what you use is certainly compelling. But I had wanted to know, are the fiscal realities as attractive as people had first thought? Cloud economics is a growing discipline and cloud cost management is already a booming industry. So what's going wrong? Is it the cloud model or is it just the way we're using it? It might be the case that there are certain players in the industry who have now realized that making use of the cloud in itself is not a cheap option. It, it's a viable option, but it's not necessarily a cheap option. Because it used to be that you would call a vendor, you would get a quote, you would be able to get that in writing and you'd prepay for things. Now it's after the fact, usage-based billing, and suddenly, whether you want to admit this or not, every engineer you have with access to a cloud account is able to incur cost. We are all procurement now, whether we know it or not. You basically, with all these capabilities you get from the cloud and you point these capabilities on the fingertips of every developer and IT uh, person out there, they can spin up new virtual machines, new services uh, in, in seconds, right? So for example, if you, you go up and you spin up one of our large MV2 series virtual machines uh, with hundreds of cores and terabyte of memory, uh, you can do that um, and it will drain your credit card within seconds. Um, so you need to be careful and you need to make sure that you have governance in place to keep your cost management um, at, on a certain level. 
So uh, at the very beginning of the of the cloud, I mean, uh, all the billing and all the actual cost of the cloud wasn't very, very clear. And I remember, you know, when I made the switch with one of my you know, companies that we were having, you know, the cloud ourselves, and then we decided you know, to move to the cloud. I mean, it was all, you know, uh, uh, very nice at the beginning because, uh, you know, it was, uh, there is no maintenance and all the things that we talked about. But I mean, we realized that the cost was actually uh, being you know, more and more because we are, pretty, we are putting everything there, you know, it was so easy. So there is definitely a realization at one point that it's not free, right? So, um, so it looks cheap, cheap, very cheap, you know, when, when, you, when you are having only, you know, a fraction of a cent you know, that is going to be for, uh, for storage or for, uh, uh, for sending data. Um, but uh, when you make, you know, the, uh, the list at the end of the month, uh, and you see that it's actually costing, can cost a lot. You pay for what you consume, right? That's one of the cloud mantras, right? You own it, you build it, you pay for it. Well, data center cost, nobody pays for that. It's a hidden cost, it's a central deployment. There's property things in there, you know, you've got power cooling, m and &E, all those kind of good stuff. You've got servers, well, your application owner wants to pay for their virtual machine. Well, on the non-premises world, they pay their 5,000 pounds for their virtual machine, and it stays there. It's well, one-off cost until this thing dies. So from day two onwards, it's free. Well, that's different in the cloud because from day two, you pay the same as you did for day one as the same as you do for day three, right? And if you're static. So there's an ongoing run cost. So RevX versus CapEx. Well, organizations are built around cash flow and capital expenditure. Well, if you move to a cloud-like world, you know you've got a revenue cost. That changes the way your finance processes have to work. That changes the way that you and internal people build to projects. I think you have to have a really good sense of what your workloads are. And I think I agree that the turn it on, turn it off, it's just easy. You can migrate, it's easy. There's a number of fallacies sort of built into that. When you look at most enterprise class workloads, what you see is that about 80% of them are on all the time. And so if you buy at the tier where you can turn it on and turn it off, you're actually spending way too much money. Now, that runs at odds with the way that the cloud is being sold. They're telling you, turn it on, turn it off. You look at it. You see, for example, a particular type of VM costs eight cents an hour. Well, that seems like hardly anything unless you leave it running for three years and then it becomes a decent amount of money. There are some that believe that the cloud pricing isn't transparent enough. I think it's the difference between a white box and a black box. Black box you can't see in, it's sort of opaque. I don't think that's where we are with cloud pricing. We have a white noise generator. When you look at the average bill, the average cloud bill, it is this array of, there are over 200 services just on Amazon, and they're each gonna have several line items on your bill every month. So the issue is, is one of complexity, not necessarily of uh, transparency. There are clearly many benefits to public cloud. Time and time again, I'd heard if you use it wisely, you can realize those elusive, predictable cost models. But I also started to wonder, things like bill shock and spiraling costs, are they just a result of the cloud's abundance? If it's there, do we just feel compelled to consume it, even if it's not the right choice? Are some organizations simply seeing the effects of overindulgence? There are a couple of inflection points. Uh, one of the most obvious is right around a million dollars a year in spend. When a company is now hitting that point and their account manager reaches out, hey, you're spending a million dollars a year. Would you like to commit to a longer term contract with us in return for some discounts? We're spending what? You get locked into that easy on and off. Uh, and then after a while, is that it, it becomes runaway costs. And that's where IT cost management um, you know, is having a field day because people have started uh, have started small, but there's been organic growth. And in that organic growth was a trap of all of the costs. In many ways, the entry level and the way that the hyperscalers are asking us to get into the cloud is like crackware. First, it is free or almost free. And then as you as say, become addicted then 
uh, you, you have sort of further downstream problems. You could have an entire, um, I don't know, Cloud Anonymous, you know, you have meetings. Hello, my name is, right? I have been three weeks since my last bad cloud decision. When talking about the cost of cloud, we can't ignore the global issues that may have an impact on its financial sustainability for some businesses and organizations. I had recently spoken to a data center operator who told me that their energy costs had effectively doubled. And that's a result of geopolitical uncertainty and of course, the resulting energy crisis. So in a world where public cloud costs have been largely static for some years, could we be about to see inflationary pressure being passed on to customers? Could this even affect the way people operate in the cloud? The prices that you're seeing are probably going to start increasing and not just because of energy and not just because of supply chain. I think there's starting to be margin pressure on some of the cloud services. And so you're gonna start seeing probably steeper price changes than you would have seen in the past. So we're seeing both a change in model as well as some things that any kind of decent economist could have spotted, uh, which is that in an era where with even 2% or even 4% inflation, prices ultimately go up. The question of inflation and hyperscalers has been raised a lot. And the way this has been dealt with in the past, because inflation has been a thing for the 15 to 20 years that cloud providers have been around. This is not a new concept. The way that this has been addressed historically has been that once they start offering something, they continue to offer it in perpetuity. But their economics of providing that, both due to law of large numbers, as well as the in time rise of computing power per watt, wind up diminishing. And that thus far has been enough to offset that. Other areas also exist within the world of the bill where they tend to charge princely rates in return for something that is felt to be overpriced. There is a lot of different services that interact together. Some of them are higher margin than others. And in so far at least, they've been able to use that to prevent passing on cost increases to customers. Whether that continues is really anyone's guess. Often when talking about cloud, we get entrenched in definitions, strategies, and of course costs. But I feel this can be distracting us from the underlying conversation. This is really about data. Data is the new oil of our age. It has monetary value. It drives innovation. And of course, it's giving us insights that may not have been possible. But we seem to have an obsessive relationship with data, and that's growing exponentially. In 2020, we were generating somewhere near 2.5 million terabytes every single day. And by 2025, that's expected to reach 460 exabytes. That's an increase of somewhere near 18,000%. So if organizations are going to continue with their public cloud first approach, will we even have the infrastructure in place to cope with this scale of data centralization? Is it time to rethink our relationship with data or perhaps where it lives? Because there's so much of it, it's often easier to just say, store it all. Someday we'll figure out if it's worth something or not. We have companies that are effectively hoarding every scrap of data that they can get their paws on. And they say that this winds up benefiting them in different ways, and who knows, maybe it does. But I know a lot more companies look at that and figure, oh, the big hyperscale companies are doing that, we should do. So they refuse to let you delete their load balancer access logs from 2012, for example, because as soon as they hire the right data science team, they're gonna be able to crack that nut. Yeah, the, the, the issue with data, the fact that we are creating more and more data today, that, you know, the, especially when we are talking about AI, right? AI is all about data today. So, uh, I mean, when we are talking about, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So data is at the heart, you know, of what we are doing. Even when you are not doing machine learning or deep learning and that you are doing simple analytics in order to do, you know, ads or whatever, you are going to need a lot of data. So that's true that the production of data is huge. Even in IoT, you know, Internet of Things, obviously, you know, those things that are producing data. And we are trying to gather them more in this, you know, cloud. And so the fact that we are collecting all this data, and by the way, not always using it, so this is another issue, but we are collecting everything, hoping that we can use them. I mean, 
physically it's going to be just impossible uh, to continue like that. Is the data going to outpace the growth of infrastructure? I think we are there now. Um, you know, our anticipation is that we will continue to double uh, total human information recorded, not just you know, not just the, the number of sensors we have, but the amount we actually try and save will continue to double every other year. Every other year, we create as much new information as mankind's ever recorded, and so we are already outstripping that. You know, today, the highest bandwidth connection we have is to load either a uh, a, a semi trailer or a jumbo jet full of solid state just drives and fly it from one location to the other. It's very bursty, right? The, the, from the time that you leave one data center, the time the first byte hits the second data center, there's a long period. But once you're there, physical transport has been and will always remain the highest bandwidth in bits derived, delivered per second. So we're already there in terms of that that uh, ability for networks not to keep up. The idea of only keeping the minimal amount of data necessary to perform your function as a business increasingly is catching on in some quarters. Because if I tokenize absolutely everything and that data winds up getting captured, okay, great, depending on how I've done that, I might not need to disclose that data breach because it contains no identifiable information for any person or entity. In other cases, it's a, huh, did, did every line of log from our web server really need to include the user's social security number? Huh, seems like a misfire in hindsight. There, people are getting sloppy with those things. I think, again, the greater question is, where's the value in this data? Um, you know, some will say, well, it's just all valuable because someday we'll figure out how to analyze it and it'll, be, it'll have purpose, right? Um, I, I'm probably not one of those people. Like, I, I fundamentally think that the data has value for a certain period of time, and then whatever that data is will be reproduced somehow, and we'll have new ways of analyzing it. So the question of, is it accessible? Yeah. Can it be transmitted? Of course. Is it usable? I have my doubts on, on a lot of it. So examples of that, you know, very simple examples, uh, are going to be, for instance, uh, what happens with uh, a credit card company recently. You know, we decided to use AI in order to um, give the credit to the to, to the their clients, right? And so they used data, historical data, you know, for 20, 30 years, and they have these beautiful models, you know. And after only a few weeks of operation, they realized that the the, the AI was actually uh, giving you know a woman half of the credit of men. It doesn't make any sense in today's society, right? I mean, same age, same uh, revenue, same everything. The only difference was the sex, right? And so, I mean, why? Because, I mean, historically, this is what happened you know, in the 50s, 60s, and so on. So the model was right, but the model was wrong for today's society, right? So we need to be very careful also because there is a bias in the data, you know, at the very time you use it, because when you use it, it's right now, and most likely what you, you collected, you know, is, is biased by history. So th th there is a, a way that we need to realize that we shouldn't maybe sometimes, you know, use this historical data. So even though people are saying, I, I don't want to throw this data away, it may be valuable in the future, that hoard mentality, hoarding mentality, part of the challenge here is that you may be saving the data, but you lost all the context. And so, even if you were to train a model, even if it seems like it's effective, until you actually can have that measurable confidence in it, because you you understand the provenance of all the information that's going in, then you really can't use it with ethical confidence. Maybe we should just you know, dump all the historical data that we that we have. <laughs> Start again. So if our obsession with data continues, it has become obvious we are going to face a different set of challenges. I'm regularly hearing differing views on where data should live. Governments are talking about it more and more, but there's a growing nervousness about missing out in the new data economy. This data sovereignty debate is no longer just about governance and compliance. It's also about opportunity. 
It's a hot geopolitical topic, and depending on where you sit on the globe, you will likely have a different view. Data sovereignty seems to be the answer for many. But how achievable is this, considering our current cloud culture? So sovereignty is a word that, again, is becoming like cloud and edge and heavily overused in our industry. And, and I think people are misconstruing what's actually meant by it. And there's, there's misconceptions around data location and data sovereignty and cloud sovereignty. When people talk about sovereignty, it's really about a maintenance of control. If I have sovereignty over my data, I should have the ability to control it and understand who's got it, understand where it's being used, understand who has rights to see it and know that there's controls in place of anyone being able to see it. So, you know, handing your data off to any old cloud, you've got no sovereignty over it because you've got no idea where it's going to be. But what I want to know is if I can say, OK, I'm going to go into this engagement in the, in the public cloud, but I know I'm going to have sovereignty over my data and I know exactly who's going to have access to it, where it's going to be stored, you know, what it's going to be used for and, and how it's going to be destroyed. And if anyone asks to look at it, whether law enforcement agency or whatever, then I'm going to be told very, you know, in no uncertain terms that that's happening. That's what people are looking for when they look at sort of data sovereignty. Cloud sovereignty is even more. A sovereign cloud typically is around a particular jurisdiction. So within a nation or within a regulatory area such as the European Union or, or, whatever, or EC or whatever it is. And with that, that's really more about meeting the needs and regulations of a particular environment. So saying, OK, fine, we need to make sure that if we do use the cloud, it's a sovereign cloud. Why? Well, because we, we're under German law, so we need a German data centre run by German employees, you know, owned by a German company, managed entirely. You know, so there's no way that some foreign agency can come in and have access to my data by some weird overacting law that they've deployed because it happens to be, you know, uh, for example, an American company that's operating that data center, for example, which is, you know, a typical thing that people are a bit worried about. So, you know, sovereignty, you need to define what you're talking about. Are we talking about data? Are we talking about physical access? Are we talking about logical access? Are we talking about virtual access? Are we talking about who has rights to see my data, who has rights to see my activity. It's a, it's a big mess, to be honest, really. Yeah, data sovereignty, uh, again, is another very abused word. And uh, I think it was kind of uh, uh, born in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, why is that, first of all? Because it's a, a sovereignty, it's a political concept. And like I said before, if we understand that our life our social life, our political life, our, you know, natural ecosystems, our industrial ecosystems, everything depends on technology. We easily understand that there is no political sovereignty without digital sovereignty. But then digital sovereignty translates into, uh, let me say, technology autonomy. And there is no economy without technology autonomy. And there is no autonomy or sovereignty that is driven by a private view of what the sovereignty or autonomy is, because of course it's not autonomous. And neither from a, an autocratic view, like for some uh, countries where the government or the main party uh, has full control of the economy. So, the understanding that we have from a political perspective, from an industrial perspective, and I hope more and more from a social perspective, is that we need to regain control on uh, our uh, data through controllable technologies, controllable data infrastructures that we unfortunately don't have today. Because today, the sovereignty is private, so it is in the hands of those who, who provide the technology. It comes down to not only the physical proximity data, but it's the legal frameworks that we should be in control of. Because if we're not in control of that, how can we map out our destiny and control that destiny where data becomes a critical national asset? It becomes the foundation of a currency in the same way as oil is a currency, gold is a currency, data is or certainly will become that all important national asset. During filming, it became clear that cultural views deeply impact cloud adoption and its utilization. Individual nations are becoming increasingly driven to unlock the potential economic advantages of their data. But people seem to be torn between their political and cultural views 
still pushing for innovation, but also juggling their regulatory requirements. Considering these factors, I wanted to know how can we unlock the potential of our data? The, the, the benefits of cloud are undeniable, but how do we consume that in a way that doesn't compromise our national sovereignty? Um, and, and also the, with the data economy, you know, data has value. Um, you know, we've seen in the UK, we've gone from being a manufacturing power to being a services culture to financial services. And now, you know, data has a lot of value, but clearly a lot of that data is, is controlled by companies that are outside of our shores. So then what, what is the future of the economy of this country and how do we maximize those kind of sovereign data assets? So this is a, a very well-respected think tank and they have estimated that 92% of all data in the Western world is actually stored in the US, not by US companies, but actually physically located in the US. So 92% of data in the US. Yeah, I think that's concerning. Do we need kind of legislation that acknowledges the fact that some things, you know, like on the internet are, you know, global phenomena by nature? and how do individual countries kind of balance their need for control or regulation versus the global capabilities that such, that such things um, enable. I believe that governments, um, like, or like IT-wise, they should have some sort of an oversight uh, uh, board or something which looks at this, like well, who is doing what, so that, okay, well, can we determine the risk a little bit and manage that? And, and I'm sure they're like doing that um, uh, on, on some levels. Yes, we have the GDPR. Yes, we have a lot of regulations. The European Commission is extremely active in developing new acts and new regulations. But let's be honest and to give you some data in the last um, three years, actually from 2017 to 2020, the market of cloud tripled in Europe and uh, the market share of European cloud service provider is less than 10%. The market share of non-European cloud service provider, despite all the declaration of the European Commission, despite all the awareness, uh, for example, the sentence from the Court of Justice called Schrems II, which basically declared that we cannot use American platforms, which is a very strong statement. Despite all these, you know, extremely strong statement, non-European players are increasing their market share. So what that means is that the market follows just one very rude, blunt rule, which is the rule of competition. Until there will be no alternative, real alternative to those technologies, we will still be hostage of technologies that are not trusted as we want, that are not controllable and interoperable as we want, and the only legislation or regulation will not fix it. We need to have regulations implemented in technology and technology that applies to existing uh, data platforms in order to make them trusted. That's exactly our intent and the project we are, we are, we are running. So you would think it's as simple as saying, you know, this is what needs to happen and this is how you're going to implement it. But unfortunately, it becomes very much politically motivated and economically motivated. Um, and I've seen that around the globe, working with regulators and advising and seeing how regulations happen. It's uh, sometimes a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest, where one country outbids the other country and gives nil point to the other one. And I'm not going to name names again, uh, but it is very much motivation of, you know, what can we get more out of it? And I've seen it from you know, very much the top tier down from the political aspect of it down to the actual regulators. I don't think that there's going to come a day where we're all going to sit around a fire, campfire and sing Kumbaya and everyone's going to want world peace and it's all going to be okay. It's not uh, going to happen, unfortunately, because everybody is very much vested in their own gains, in terms, whether it's a country, whether it's an organization, it's about what they can gain out of it. So that, that's a very challenging thing. And I think it's got to the stage now that I think because of the, if you like, the pivot of the adoption curve with cloud that now means there are a very small number of very large players who by and large all come from the same country, then that starts some rumblings in some other countries about, well, wait a minute, we're basically exporting all of our data for free to you know, a foreign state. Um, and that's, it's fine as long as that foreign state 
as an ally. We talk a lot about sovereignty of, you know, the, 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 where is the data, where does it belong, can, you know, any secret service or something, you know, looking at it. And of course, you know, when we talk about cloud, philosophically, and that we talk about this, you know, nebulous thing that is up there, and it doesn't really matter, we don't get it. But actually, as we said earlier, this is data centers. Those data centers, they are, you know, at places. And of course, you know, there are places where it's easier for some agencies, let's say, to go, you know, to see what is inside than, you know, some other. So, so that's why, you know, sovereignty is something very interesting. Some businesses, you know, and if we talk about, for instance, the French government at one point that decided, you know, for all their medical data to give it to Azure, you know, it's a decision that has, you know, implications. I mean, I don't know if it's very interesting for uh, an American agency to look at the uh, medical, you know, uh, um, uh, data of French people, but maybe it is, right? So at one point there is a, a need, there is a, you know, a will that is going to be that we want to have the control of the data. So that's why we hear a lot about, you know, the, the, the secure cloud, or the sovereign cloud or stuff like that. So it's more and more like that. So because more and more people, they don't want people to go to sniff, to go to sniff, you know, their data. But I mean, it's it's a difficult thing. It's it's very, the reality, as I said earlier, you know, is that nothing is secure in any way, right? So, so there will be possibility to sniff. But this very uh, notion of uh, uh, sovereign cloud is something that we need to think about more and more and to decide also collectively in a country, Europe, I mean, to not to share maybe our data with, with other uh, agencies. So the future of the cloud itself and the future of humans who rely on that sort of a digital infrastructure is something that people have been debating a lot about. Now, I don't believe that we will be able to roll back in time and find an alternate, a completely new alternative to the cloud. The cloud will stay as the backbone to our economy, to our economies. Uh, they do run certain applications in a fantastic way that we will not be able to replace. But what will the future of the cloud look like? I believe what we're going to see is that more localized digital computing infrastructure to emerge there'll be more computing that will be done locally. And this is primarily because of necessity. So for example, if you take it, look at some of the laws around data protection, the laws of the land, the laws of the land in the country that I live in would be radically different from, let's say, another country. So to protect the citizens of a country, it would be absolutely essential that we process data that adhere to the laws of the land where I produce my data. And for this, it naturally means that localized processing, localized compute has to emerge. In 2001, the US made changes to surveillance laws in the wake of 9-11. In the name of national security, the Patriot Act was passed, granting the US further powers. This is regularly cited as a concern for non-US based organizations. But I wanted to know how much of a challenge has this really become? Right now, I think that there is a collective delusion going on about the idea of data sovereignty and, ah, that data must live in data centers within the borders of our country. Great, it's still run by a company that is a US-based company. Corey, as a technologist, as an American, what is your view on the US Patriot Act? Oh dear Lord, that is a loaded question. I think it was a knee-jerk response to a event where tensions were running high, dissent was almost unthinkable, and as lawyers are fond of saying, tough cases make for bad law. It was overreaching. We're still dealing with a lot of the fallout from it. And it's very easy to wind up saying in the moment when something terrible is going on that we need, we need extraordinary powers, we need additional controls that weren't there before. But it's very hard for those things to get unwound in the fullness of time. Laws don't expire most of the time on their own. There has to be the same will to remove it. The, the T's and C's of American companies is always a little bit vague. You know, all the stuff that I've seen, which, which says that actually wherever it's hosted, if it's on our platform, it's American data. We can still have a look, right? Um, 
I'm not aware of any occurrences of them doing that, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they, they, they've, they've probably, you know, there's, there's been a few pokings going on that, that, that certainly we're not aware of. They need to request to Microsoft to say, okay, well, this, this status, like we have a customer there, and we want to have access to that data. Uh, it's stored in like a Europe location, give this. Uh, um, we make these things public, right? We, we actually show the numbers uh, for like the requests we have. And then we also have like, hey, this is not a request which is actually like, we're not just going to do it, right? If like, it's not a valid request, we, we also block. So we, we release the numbers somewhere where we say, hey, that's the amount of requests we got. That's how many we actually blocked. And that's the amount we gave in because there are definitely certain cases where it makes sense, right? To give that, um, it's a very, very tough uh, uh, place uh, to be uh, for everyone, right? Because again, we are always now talking about, okay, this, we don't have any, we are the good guys, right? We are like, hey, we, we have like our company data, we have organization data, we have health, like all that good stuff. But there are people, there are people out there who are doing bad things. And so I understand that there needs to be some sort of a thing and it's, that's basically for legal uh, to, to battle this out. Nobody can deny the benefits of public cloud and we all enjoy many of its benefits. But if so many individual technologists, organizations and governments are following the same fashion, do we need to start thinking about our dependencies at a higher level? It's hard not to worry that such a trend could pose systemic risk to both businesses, but also to our national infrastructure. Whilst traveling, I had begun to wonder, is anyone thinking about our societal resilience? It seems almost daily that we hear about the latest global catastrophe. They're often referred to as black swan events. They take us by surprise and they have far reaching impact to the way we live and work. But could our societal dependency on such a small number of platforms pose a systemic risk? Could this be the next black swan event? So when people ask, do you think that there is systemic risk in having so much of the world's computing infrastructure dependent upon one or a very small number of providers, my response is generally a barely politer version of welcome to the conversation. It absolutely is a concern. It's something that has been a slow creeping worry in the back of folks' head for a long time. There's been a significant reluctance to articulate that in many more professional environments just because it's, it's easy to come off as an anti-cloud conspiracy theorist. I think that that is something that we have yet to reckon with as a society. Now, some countries have regulators looking into this in more or less effective ways, but it's something that we as a global society, if you'll pardon the aspirational Star Trekian view, really need to start thinking about at a deeper level. I don't necessarily think that this means that we should disband the cloud providers because the capability story is definitely better than what came before, but how do we wind up putting guardrails on this? Realistically, the only thing stopping from slapping another zero onto the end of all of their prices is their own internal philosophy. There's remarkably little stopping them in an absolutist sense if the company decides that is what's best for them. So if there is an issue today, you know, let's see a big cable, you know, across the Atlantic, you know, being cut or whatever. I mean, this is bad because I mean, uh, we put basically all our eggs in the same basket, right? Which is one of those big trees. So, um, so that's at the same time, you know, very practical, of course. But if there is an issue, this is a global issue. So it becomes, you know, very, very, very bad. But every workload I've ever seen in production has a whole bunch of third-party dependencies on other companies. Specialization is a thing. No one is building everything start to finish. If you're all in on AWS, and well, that's a problem for us because if AWS goes down, our website will go down too. So at fantastic time and energy and expense, you wind up migrating that workload entirely out of AWS into your own data center or to another cloud provider. Great. And then there's a big outage, it takes out AWS and your shopping cart provider is all in on AWS and they're down. Okay, how, how do you test such a thing like that? or your shopping cart provider is up, but one of their critical third-party dependencies is on AWS and that goes down and that in turn takes them down as well. How do you solve these problems? It's turtles all the way down. And that is why AWS or any other hyperscaler going down 
poses such a deep systemic risk to basically everyone and everything. You cannot believe how business critical or like critical for the world even I would say uh, these cloud vendors are today, right? Like how many businesses rely on this and would not work on it? Or think about even like like critical things like healthcare, right? What 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 you? I mean, they would still run probably for like days, but like a lot of important things are now done in the cloud. I'm disturbed that people aren't talking about that more. Yes, they're extremely reliable. They're going to have reliability that far exceeds what you or I could build in a data center. But the problem is not the way what we used to have, where today your hospital goes down and tomorrow my bank goes down. It's all of those things go down simultaneously. Now what? And regulation is clearly not the answer to that because what is regulation going to do? It's going to incentivize not going down. These providers are not exactly incentivized to fall over today. They already have significant financial penalties that they pay. They take massive reputational hits that basically forestall other people adopting their solutions. They already don't want to go down, but things break. They always will. And how do we plan for that? How do we mitigate that? It becomes the work of a lifetime. Yes, we have big dependency, but we cannot uh, surrender. We need to gain control of our data, in particular the most critical ones. So that requires the qualification of data, which is exactly the exercise the public sector is doing in every country. Every government is qualifying the level of risk, the level of criticality of their data. Second, we need to provide platforms, trusted platforms, and, and that host trusted services that can deal with that type of uh, criticality. So, uh, public cloud will be fantastic and perfect for many solutions, but there will be some solutions in both the private sector, industrial, and in the private in the public sector that will require different type of trust. And this is possible. And uh, the the simple idea we have had in, in Gaia X is the following: Let's not reinvent the wheel. We, we're not going to redesign uh, a new platform. We are not going to re define a European giant that is going to compete with the, the American giants. Not at all. This, is, this would be foolish. We are not going to close the market to become the king of our small European kingdom because we want to be competitive in the global market. Because like I said before, this is a forest. So we need to be in the real global world. But we can do one thing. We can invent a new layer that can stay on top of any existing service and technology and provide the required and necessary level of trust. And trust equals, in, in my simple view, to three words. Transparency, controllability, interoperability. When now we look forward to that data outstripping the physics and economics of that model and then embracing this distributed model, I think you'll find a new sweet spot and hopefully that is a much more egalitarian and open democratized environment where you don't just have a couple of key players that have specific collections of resources. It actually ends up being a much more broad economic development and enabling environment. And I think that's where, I think that's where we're headed. It strikes me as interesting that amongst such a large number of organizations that still maintain a public cloud first stance, Others have come forward and said that hybrid cloud offers a more feasible and even logical direction. I wanted to know, what are the benefits of hybrid cloud over public cloud only? If it is more viable, why aren't more people implementing it as their strategy? So when customers have like uh, concerns about hybrid, then it's mainly about, hey, is this just a way uh, for, for you to make me move to the cloud? Or is it actually an honest thing to actually bring the value from the cloud to, to, to my on-premises environment? And, and when you look at how cloud vendors spoke uh, to customers over the last decade or so, um, you might have a good point of asking that question. Um, but again, like we are very serious about bringing all that down. Um, and it, we really like acknowledge that um, this is not just to to uh, like get you into the cloud or make you migrate everything to the cloud, but really drive your business value. Hybrid cloud is, is more than a legitimate strategy. It's, it's a default. You, most organizations you talk to are already in a hybrid state. They've got some stuff on premises. They've got some stuff 
in a cloud, public cloud, colo, whatever it is. They've got stuff that in running in things that they control and they've got stuff running on stuff that they don't control or however you want to look at that. So hybrid is a default state for nearly every organization we deal with. Cloud is not just like in the future, it's not going to be like this, just these uh, big cloud vendors, data center locations. Cloud really will extend from the cloud vendors, data centers to the data center of the customers and even their edge locations, right? So we will see this hybrid scenario evolve even more. We're not hybrid yet. Um, this is the thing that we are now currently, we know we need to be, or we think we need to be, right? How do we justify that and how do we operate that, right? So we've done the public cloud, we've dipped our toes into that, we've got a couple of, of ways that, that, that we are consuming and delivering services in that. So there's like an on network and that's linked back to our on-premises stuff. And then there's the off network, it's internet consumed only, right? And then we've got the traditional IT, which is living in a traditional way. Now we've got two ways of working with two different tool sets and two different processes and almost two different sets of people. Now, they're, they're not two different sets of people, but you know, there's, there's almost this kind of schizophrenic line down the middle of folk. You've got your old traditional folk who are going, this is what I do, this is how I do it, this is how I've always done it. And then you've got all these people over here going, well, that's just all wrong, you don't want to do that, you want to do it this way, right? So there, there's, there's, there's tension between all of this, these, these people and their skill set. You've got a bunch of enterprise folk who are now going, well, how are my skills relevant in this new world? How do I make myself relevant? And again, I think this is where the hybrid cloud kind of conversation comes in. It's not a hosting location. It's a set of skills. It's a mindset. It's a, it's a set of processes. It's how you do what you do, right? And you achieve the same outcome. You're just doing it in a slightly different way. People are still going to have critical assets on-premise in their own data centers. They're, they will push the workloads that are useful into the cloud. So hybrid is going to be with us for a very, very long time. So the new era of the cloud, which has, I mean, the awareness of which has started just recently, but it's uh, definitely the biggest disruption after the internet, is the real distributed federated cloud era. We really speak now about this um, uh, concept of the distributed cloud, um, to use another term here, uh, where we really see, hey, uh, we understand we want to reduce dependencies, right? We want to make sure that we don't rely on like that there's no single point of failure uh, in, in the whole system, not just talking about now like technology, but like in general in the whole system that even if something goes down, you can still do your, um, uh, do your work. And that is what customers want, right? They need to, they are risk aware. They want to have something which has as less de dependencies as possible when it's critical. So in this new era, of course, the cloud must be hybrid. Of course, we're going to have different type of clouds. The edge requires, you know, distributed data centers, distributed cloud, and they have to be fit for the purpose. There is no way you can bring data from, I don't know, uh, a local um, uh, diagnosis machine running on an ambulance if you want to intervene in real time, if you want to bring those data back to somewhere on the other side of the ocean, elaborate them and bring them back again. And if you, even if you adopt the 5G or the 6G or the 7G, there is a limit, which is the light speed. So there must be a new paradigm of bringing the compute to the data. This is another very innovative element that technologists know very well. So the compute to data is the new paradigm. The distributed cloud is the new paradigm. The hybrid is natural. So when I think of the, the benefits to the enterprise of hybrid, it is solving economics, physics, and law with precision. That we're no longer in the, the era where we can afford, oh well, it's pretty good, it's good enough. Now we at this point, in order to remain competitive and more to, to lean into sustainability, to lean into equity, into, into security, into privacy, we need precise solutions and we can no longer afford that sort of general purpose. Uh, so for me, hybrid means that opportunity to, to fine tune, to gain precision in a solution. Because of the past 20 years that we are talking about, you know, 10 and 10 that are really, you know, the premise years and the, uh, and the cloud years, because of the learning that we have, been making you know in the past in those past years, I really think that we are going into the hybrid you know uh, 
a decade, you know, for the next few decades actually, uh, where we are going to balance, you know, those two, uh, those two things. And, uh, and there will be maybe also something new, and the something new might be uh, uh, this, uh, this distribution that I was talking about earlier uh, on the edge. So it's very possible that this balance between the two might become a collaboration of edge computers. If the future of cloud is predicted to be more distributed, it will undoubtedly require a shift in mindset. The compute will inevitably need to move towards the data. And that's one of the reasons why the edge has become such a prominent area for forward-thinking technologists. I think edge is a term that's being used out there to make uh, architects, application developers, you name it, anyone involved in IT understand that the future of applications is actually as it's always been highly distributed. And once you get that, and you realize it's not all about putting it in one cloud, it's about putting it in multiple clouds, and then putting multiple elements across multiple physical locations, then you realize that actually it's, it's a huge distribution. You don't necessarily need to have it be monolithically in the cloud. Distributed is more the way we would see it. There are lots of physical things out there today, and they run on proprietary systems. Well, they can run on commodity hardware and smart software, and as a result of that, actually be more performant and produce better outcomes. But how do you do that? Well, you take the concepts of cloud, um, like cloud native development, the, the ease and scale of that, but you bring it down to edge computing, you know, that eight core box or that single processor server that now can run what acts like a cloud, but really is a very small compute environment, collecting your data, analyzing your data, producing an outcome, and real in a real-time environment. So our, our view of it is that those applications that are currently stuck in the cloud need to transform down to the edge. When I think of when I think of an edge system and I think of organizations, one is just that's where the data is going to be. What do we all want to do? The right thing, the right thing for our customers, for our team members, for our shareholders, uh, for our society, and for us that means I've gotten that information, I've gained an insight, and then I'm going to take an action, and I can justify that action because of the insight I've had, and we can no longer tolerate just the small amount of information that we can eventually transmit into a data center, run the analysis on, and then hope that we can take an action in time. So it, the edge presents us with that opportunity, that opportunity to gain insight from more information, to reason over more information, to gain those deep insights in a time that matters, and then turn those insights into action, because action no longer is just one line on a dashboard inside of the network operations center. It's applications pulled out to millions, perhaps even billions of individuals through their mobile devices and through intelligent social infrastructure. So the edge for me is where all of that insight, where all of those actions are going to be taking place. And we're gonna see the, the distributed nature of things, the interconnectedness of things, you know, exponentially grow. So anyone that's thinking about stuff being in one place is not going to be thinking the right thinking for you know, the next 10 years. It's now how are you going to take advantage of huge amounts of data being available and being highly democratized, highly interconnected. There are amazing use cases for every flavor of cloud. But at this stage of my journey, it's become clear. We need to remain conscious of all of these nuanced issues if we are ever going to unlock the cloud's true potential. We went through so much in the past few years and without cloud technology and the types of uh, tech advancements that we have, I don't think globally anybody could have functioned. You know, we've been through probably the most volatile two years in terms of, you know, upsetting things that we've seen. Um, that's not going to stop anytime soon, right? All I can do is base my decision on the facts that I have right now today with the full consequence of I'm pretty damn well sure they're going to change tomorrow. And we have to acknowledge that, you know, cloud architects, IT architects of all kinds, would just love to rip up what we've got today and start with a blank sheet of paper and say, this is the brave new world. But as we've discussed, and as has been proven over the last decade or more, that's not the reality of where we are. 
When you're formulating a cloud strategy, there are a few things to bear in mind. Having done an awful lot of them, I can safely say that you can take cost off the table. You will not save money on a cloud migration, all in, on anything approaching a less than five year time horizon. So set it out of your mind. The reason to go cloud is the capability story. It enables you to move faster in a whole bunch of different ways. Now, if you have a steady state workload that hasn't meaningfully changed for the last 20 years, well, why do you want to move that to cloud? Because remember, we're taking cost off the table. Is there any benefit to increasing how nimble that workload is? Perhaps not. It all comes down to the, the same thing I tend to exhort people on in a whole bunch of different contexts. Understand why you're doing the thing that you're doing and then work backwards from there. What is the outcome you're chasing? Okay, is cloud the right way to go there? Yes, that is a path. Is it the only path? No. Is it the best path? That depends on you. Humans don't adopt technology as fast as it can evolve. Uh, we sort of, as it's changing, capture it in a moment and call it something like edge or IoT or knowledge management. Or, and in that period of time, we try to make the most of it. And it's still going, right? There's someone doing something that's evolving uh, that technology. or just using it in a different way. And they're gonna come out showing us all that it, there, there was a better way to do it. <laughs> in, in this very domain, I mean, people are ready to evolve. People are really ready to, uh, uh, to change and to change their view and to learn something else and to see stuff with another prism. right? So that, that's very interesting in the, in the domain of, uh, of innovation. But of course, once now, you know, you have to bring those innovations to the people who are used to do something, you know, for years. And, and this is where, you know, you, you are fighting, you know, a very interesting crowd. I mean, there might be technologists, there might be people who claim that they are good at technology and that they are doing technology, you know, for years. You still, you know, have to educate those people. And at the end of the day, I mean, the, 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 the key word is education there because you have to explain to those guys why this change is important. But that's really that it's sometimes difficult to change the people that are, you know, technologists. Cloud first doesn't mean that it needs to be in one of the big hyperscalers, because what the big hyperscalers are saying, cloud really now extends to everything. So it's absolutely okay to run out there and make sure that like everyone in the company gets that mindset, even though it's pretty, pretty tough. So, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to find, like, um, it can be very hard to, to convince people when, like, they have a certain opinion, especially in cloud computing. There are an awful lot of reasons to pursue any particular technology or strategy, but I want to take one of them off the board completely. Your own resume. I like working on interesting things, too. As a result, I go in directions where people using that technology have problems that I know how to fix. I don't try to shoehorn this technology that I love into every possible solution case that it might reasonably be expected to fit. Because that's not being a technologist, that's being a zealot. At the end of this part of my journey, one thing is clear. There is no one size fits all, no matter how much people wanted it to be public cloud. Our digital future, and I could even go as far as saying our civilization, is in the hands of individual technologists. How they choose to architect platforms for business and our society has never been so important. After hundreds of conversations, I'm excited to see how we respond to the growing demands for cloud computing. Hybrid is logical, and the promise of the edge is tantalizing. But it's also safe to say that cloud is no longer a destination, and cloud first is a retiring trend. Even the hyperscalers are backing a more distributed and hybrid world. It's my hope that technologists, organizations and governments remain conscious of how they build our cloud-like future. Personally, I think this is something that we should be talking about more openly. I'll soon be embarking on the next part of my journey to further investigate the nuances of cloud. But for now, I'll leave you with someone who I think said it best. But essentially, it's one sentence. It's put the right workload in the right place for the right reason. Underlined. That's it.